Welcome, my name is Marcel. My name is Johan. We are here to introduce you to the antenna panel demonstrator and the evaluation boards of the 5G millimeter wave analog beamformers of NXP. This is an overview of the assembled board. It consists out of the main board, which supplies a millimeter wave circuitry and, on the right, the interface board. The power supply is split in four rows. The supply current can be measured per row. The heat sinks are applied to enable operation over minus 40 to plus 55 degrees Celsius ambient temperature of the panel with casing. The supply voltage can be measured at the buses on the right of the main panel. The buses are there to connect the load to validate the VI curves of the supplies. On this slide we show the details of the analog beamformer. This is the 26 GHz product, the MMW 9014K. This serves the N258 band around 26 GHz. NXP offers also a MMW 9012K, which serves the N257 band around 28 GHz. On the right, the block diagram is shown. The millimeter wave section has two common ports, which are connected to four channels each. The channels are interlaced to enable easy connection to a dual polarized antenna element. Each channel consists of a transmit receive switch and a beamformer lineup. For the receive side, the lineup consists out of an LNA VGA phase shifter and output buffer. For the transmit side, it consists out of an input buffer, phase shifter, VGA and PA. A switch connects the beamformer lineups with the on chip 124 splitter network. The control is done via an SBI interface, which can use either a LVDS or a four-lane SBI CMOS physical interface. The time division duplex switch can be controlled via a pin and via the control bus. The on-chip temperature and power can be detected and read out. The characteristic of the TX chain are 0.29 watt per channel, P1dB of 20dB, EVM of 2.5%, at an output power of 9 dBm and a power gain of 29.5 dB. In receive mode, the device has a power dissipation of 0.19 Watt per channel and a power gain of 24 dB and a noise figure of 5.8 dB. It comes in a 6.5 times 6.1 times 0.56 mm fan out wave level package. This is the antenna panel demonstrator as you receive it in the box. In the box you find the antenna panel demonstrator, the power supply, power cord, a fan, the fan is only needed in compression point measurements, and a memory stick containing the software. To start the evaluation, take the antenna panel demonstrator, remove the ESD bag, Take the power supply and connect it to the barrel connector and the other side to the mains. Use the USB cable to connect to your computer and apply the software from the memory stick. In the design of an antenna panel, trade-offs must be made between EM requirements, board warpage, thermal design and the force applied to the ICs. For the EM requirements, the antenna structures are important. A design must be made which can handle the right reflection coefficient over the bandwidth and the scanning range. For the splitting networks, we chose to have the input of one polarization on one side and the input of the other polarization on the other side. This is a corporate splitting network. The challenge in the design is to keep the isolation at the right level, especially because the feeds and the lines are very close to each other in one section of the splitting network. And this is done by burying one of the lines such that the isolation increases. For the thermal design, the board must not warp very much. To handle the board warpage, we use a 12 layer design and we balance the copper in the top and the bottom. We also designed a clamp. This is the clamp for the top side, it's made out of nylon, and this is the clamp on the bottom side. 
This way we could minimize the warpage in the design. This is the way the assembled clamps look like. Normally the chips are mounted on the board, but we don't have that in this example. To assemble it, you have to apply a thermal interface material and this is an example of it. And since it is suspendable, the height changes when you apply a force. And that's important now because the chips, which are normally mounted here, can only withstand a certain force. So the way we have assembled it is that we mounted the board on the thermal interface material. And we applied a force such that it doesn't exceed the maximum. Then we measured the height and then we removed the force and applied screws to the same height. So that's where these screws come in. The antenna panel demonstrator comes with a number of interfaces. You can see them at the bottom. A 2.4 millimeter connector for the vertical, for the horizontal, a USB connector for the interface, a barrel connector 2.5, 5.5 millimeter for the power, and an SMB connector to drive a fan. The fan is supplied and only needed in case of high temperature 1 dB compression point measurement. The fan can be connected to the heatsink. If you want to remove the casing in case you don't have enough space in your test setup, you have to remove those four screws. If you have disassembled the antenna panel demonstrator, the core is still functional. So here you have the 2.4 millimeter vertical connector, the 2.4 millimeter horizontal connector, the USB connector, the barrel connector feeding the main board and the interface. And on the interface you have access to more connectors than with the casing. You have the fan control, but you also have triggers and other interfaces. They are described in the documentation. For the bring-up, since the analog beamformer chips in the system are digitally controlled, you need a interface that converts your USB commands from the software to the digital bitstream that controls the chips. We recommend for the bring-up to design some additional interfaces for debugging this digital communication system. The chips in the system are daisy chains, so each chip is the input for the next chip. And the last one is going back to the FPGA to control if the chips received the proper commands. For that check of the software and the digital, digital communication of this daisy chain, we recommend you to design a so-called loop-through interface. That interface can be connected to the FPGA board that you have designed with the firmware for the system. This is the FPGA board, this is the loop-through board. You connect it to the FPGA, connect the FPGA via the USB to your PC and give it supply because this, this board in this case also supplies the FPGA board. On that board we have some probe possibilities to check the digital clock and the digital data in and out. So with this board without the system available you can already check your software and the digital stream. In addition to that, when you have the system available, we also recommend you to design an interface where you can really probe the digital stream of the control software to the system. So really checking the clock, the data and the chip select bit because the protocol that is used in this system is SPI. With this you need to disconnect 
the FPGA from the system. Here you have the system without the casting. You can disconnect the FPGA board. A small cable can be needed. It is not really needed because you can also connect this interface directly, but for convenience I have this additional cable that can be used to connect this board to the panel with the RF system on it. And then you connect it to the FPGA again. Now you have the system and you have to take care of the certain startup sequence. So what we recommend is to first connect your, the FPGA to your PC, give the FPGA some time to initialize the firmware, and then supply the panel with, via the barrel with the supply. Now the system is, is started up. If you then start the control software and you choose the right interface, you get this screen. If you now say to the software, I want to know the temperature of all the 16 chips in the system because they have an internal temperature sensor. You press temperature sensor and you will get the actual temperature of each chip. They are all in idle mode, so no RF functionality, but they give all roughly the room temperature of the chip. With this, it is confirmed that the communication with all 16 chips is okay. But with this additional interface, you have the possibility, in case of some errors, to check the digital signaling. Since we have chosen to use the LVDS option of the MMW um, analog beamformer chips here, we recommend you to have a differential probe. LVDS is a differential digital signal. You can also use single-ended probes, but then you have the leveling is slightly different compared to checking it with a differential probe. If I now connect the differential probe to the clock, you see a burst of clock pulses and in the data sheet of this system or of the chip, you will see that each command, each SPI command needs 144 bit pulses to communicate with the chip. So each command has 144 clock pulses to uh, control the chip. NXP also provides evaluation kits uh, to enable customers to uh, do a connectorized RF evaluation of a single analog beamformer chip. It comes in an ESB, ESD box, as you see, and it uh, contains USB cable, some supply cables to supply the chip, an interface to convert the USB commands also to the digital commands that, need, that are needed for uh, controlling the chip, an evaluation board, an RF evaluation board, and the chip provided or provided with a heatsink to control the temperature. In addition to that, also a USB stick with all the relevant documentation like control software, de-embed files to de-embed the RF tracks on the board and the connectors that you really can RF evaluate the chip in an isolated manner. Here you see the evaluation board without the heatsink and without the digital uh, interface, the RF connectors, the chip mounted to 
RF feeds, since it is dual polarized, and then the antenna ports to be connected to the antennas in your millimeter wave system. So here we are at our uh, small anagonic chamber uh, to evaluate the millimeter wave uh, antenna demonstrator. What we use here is a, a horn antenna that is connected to the analyzer as the receiving antenna in this case. So with the analyzer you can analyze the quality of the signal. And with this cable we drive the millimeter wave antenna uh, demonstrator. For the beam that we use to radiate from the, from the demonstrator, we use a MATLAB script. And with that MATLAB script, all the settings to the chips are calibrated and gives a boreside beam in this case. So it's pointing to the horn antenna. So if, if the generator which is used to uh, generate the 5G and R modulated signal. If I turn on the RF signal, which is a 26 gigahertz signal in this case, because the, the demonstrator is meant for the N258 band of the 5G millimeter wave frequency. I turn it on already and you see that the spectrum appears. With the 5G and R tap, you can also analyze the modulation in terms of EVM. So, and we see now that I have roughly 1.8% uh, percent EVM over the air. To determine the over the air path loss of the setup, we use two known gain horns and a network analyzer. With the known antenna gain and an over the air result of approximately minus 16 dB, we concluded a path loss of 58 dB over 60 cm. For the evaluation setup of the antenna panel, this results in an over the air budget of 37 dB. With the 5G new radio signal being generated and fed into the panel demonstrator and the bore side beam being activated, we achieve an EVM as shown in this slide over the frequencies of the N258 band. Translating this to the panel effect effective isotropic radiated power, the EIRP, the panel shows an EVM of less than 2% up to 45 dBm EIRP. Thank you very much for uh, your attention and for additional information you can always contact NXP.com.